Well, the short talk is this. I did a lot of math, I made a lot of money, and I gave almost all of it away. That's the story of my life. Now, <laughs> it's a good story, but it's short. So, when I was a little boy, I, uh, I liked math in the sense that I liked to, when I was three or four or something, like to double the numbers to four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera. I got up to 1,024, and I said, enough of that. But, uh, but I, I like doubling numbers. And uh, when I was a little boy also, I was in my father's, my father was driving me, and uh, he said he has to go to a gas station and get gasoline. I said, why do you need to get gasoline? He says, well, we, the car needs gasoline. I said, but you shouldn't need to have to get gasoline. You could just use half of what you now have, and then half of that, and half of that, and half of that, and you'll never run out of gas. <laughs> Well, that was called Zeno's Paradox, but uh, of course it didn't occur to me that we wouldn't get very far either, but uh, <laughs> there, there it was. But I did always, always like math, and uh, I went to MIT, and uh, I took a graduate course right in my freshman year which uh, was puzzling to me. It was abstract algebra. But during this uh, summer, I figured it all out. I got a book, I figured it all out, and, uh, and then took a lot of math courses at MIT. Um, and, uh, well, the field that I really liked was called differential geometry. How many of you have ever heard of differential geometry? Okay. The old folks know about differential geometry. Well, differential geometry is a study of uh, curved spaces in, in many uh, dimensions, with typically with a metric on it, so you can see how far apart any two points would, would be. And uh, I really like that field. And, well, um, I went to Berkeley to get my, well, I, I, I graduated MIT in three years, so I stayed as a graduate student for a year, and then they told me, you should go to Berkeley. And I said, why, why should I go to Berkeley? They said, well, the great man in your field, differential geometry, a man named Chern, is just going to Berkeley, and you should work under Churn. So I said, okay. So I went out to Berkeley. Uh, regrettably, uh, Churn was taking a sabbatical leave that year, and so he wasn't there. So I worked with someone else, and that, that worked out fine. Uh, it, w it was interesting uh, working with this guy. Uh, I came up with a little theorem and I showed it to him, and he said, oh, that's a nice little theorem. It puts in mind uh, an open question, which I won't really describe to you, but, uh, but don't work on that question. I said, why? He said, because it's too tough. Uh, this, this one worked on it and tried, and that one worked on it and tried. Well, of course, that just sort of got me going, and uh, I said, okay, but I, I'm, I'm going to work on this problem. And, uh, well, uh, I did, and I solved the problem, and I was very pleased with myself, and uh, went back to teach at MIT and Harvard. But for reasons which I won't go into, I, uh, I needed money. And I had borrowed money to invest in a company with some friends of mine, uh, and uh, 
I need, needed to pay it back. But there was a place in Princeton called the Institute for Defense Analyses, which was a highly uh, classified place uh, un under the aegis of uh, the government, the Defense Department. And what we're supposed to do is uh, break Russian codes. Well, that was an interesting challenge. Uh, I liked the work. They told us uh, you could do your own mathematics up to half your time, but you, the other half you had to do, you know, this code cracking business. And uh, well, uh, during that period, I was very interested in an area of mathematics called minimal surfaces. Does any of you know what a minimal surface is? Well, someone must know what a minimal surface is. Okay, so a minimal surface is a surface of minimal area with respect to its boundary. So imagine taking a wire frame, just a any closed frame, dip it in so in, in so soap suds, and then take it out, and there'll be a film that is bounded by this thing, and that film, that soap film, has less area than any other surface with that boundary. So that's a minimal, that's a minimal surface. And uh, uh, the first Fields Prize winner uh, back in maybe 1905 uh, had proved that any such boundary would have a minimal surface, just one, and it would be smooth. It wouldn't have any points or anything like that. It would just be a nice, smooth surface. And as I said, he won the Fields Medal for that. And um, so I got interested in that area while, while I was there at, uh, at the Institute for Defense Analyses. So in my spare time, which was quite a lot. Uh, I worked on that problem because in higher dimensions it was an open, was an open problem. Someone had done it in one dimension higher, uh, so that would be uh, a, a, a three-dimensional surface with a two-dimensional boundary in four-dimensional space. And uh, well, uh, but that's where it stopped. So I worked on that problem in higher dimensions and was uh, lucky enough to uh, solve the problem through ambient dimension seven. But in dimension eight, my proof didn't work. And, uh, and I constructed what I thought was a counterexample. A counterexample is something that uh, you, you you think you have a, you've proved a theorem, but someone comes along with an example that shows you didn't prove that theorem because this is a counterexample. So uh, I found what I thought was a counterexample. I couldn't prove it, but a couple of years later, uh, the paper got published. It was, it was a pretty good paper, actually. And, um, but a few years later, a couple of mathematicians, one of whom was named Bombieri, and uh, showed that my counterexample was really a counterexample. So that killed the problem altogether. Well, uh, at a certain point, I came to Stony Brook University. I was 30 years old to be the chair of their math department which was not a very strong department. And I was pretty young to be the chairman, but uh, I thought it would be fun. And I had a lot of money to work with because the governor at the time was a guy named Rockefeller. Now, I think everyone has probably heard of the name Rockefeller, but if, has anyone not heard of the name Rockefeller? Okay, most of you have heard of 
Rockefeller. Rockefeller loved the state university and was pouring money on it, so I had a lot of money to work with and uh, hired some terrific people. So, hired some terrific people. But at the same time, in that time frame, I started to get interested in another area of math. And uh, I worked on that area and came up with something really quite beautiful in three dimensions. It was a function, I can't really describe it, but it, it lived in three dimensions, closed three-dimensional spaces. And I was quite pleased. I showed it to Churn. I, I, said, I showed it, I, we, I sent it by the mail, because in those days there was no email. And Chern said, well, you've done this in three dimensions, but it should work in all dimensions. I was very dubious, but I said, okay, let's work together and see. And he was right. It would work in all dimensions. And I was very pleased. We published the paper. And about five years later, a physicist named Witten saw this paper and thought, and he was right, it could apply to physics. And then some other physicists saw how it could apply to physics. I didn't know any physics at all. Chern might have known something, but uh, it never occurred to him that it would apply to physics. And remarkably, so you never know where something will go. You think you're doing math and you're actually doing physics, maybe, or whatever. So today, that is called Chern-Simons theory. It's all over the place in physics. On average, every day, four papers in physics reference this Chern-Simons theory. So I can't take any credit for it at all, but, uh, but there it was, and of course, I'm quite pleased about it, but uh, I can't say that, oh, I, I invented this for physics. Well, shortly after that, I started to get interested in the world of investments. I had come in a, to a, a very small amount of money, but it was enough to start investing. And one thing led to another. I started hiring people, and we made what was called a hedge fund. And it was remarkably successful. It's still going. I'm not with it anymore. But I made a tremendous amount of money from this, um, from this hedge fund. Now, my lovely wife, Marilyn, said, let's give some of it away. So uh, I said, okay, fine. So we gave some charity. And then she said, well, why don't we start a foundation? And uh, okay, start a foundation. She started a foundation. I put money into it. The good thing about putting money into a foundation is you can give the money away. You get the tax advantage. But it doesn't have to be spent immediately. So you can put money into the foundation and say, well, we'll see what we want to do with it tomorrow or next year or whatever. But it grew and grew and grew. So uh, it, it, it today, oh, well, we decided to focus on science with our uh, foundation focus on science, 90% uh, of it should be science, Eight, 60 of that should be basic science, and 30 of that could be translational science, and 10% could be education and outreach and things like that. So today, 
uh, that fo foundation is extremely large. And uh, so most of the money that I made was put into the foundation. So um, I'm not so rich as I was before, but uh, rich enough. And uh, we had this wonderful foundation. And uh, running it most of the time was my wonderful wife. Any questions? No questions? Yeah, Yuri is in the foundation. He, he just talked. Uh, the question, how did you manage to get such a wonderful wife? <laughs> That's a very good question. I could go into that, but it's a long story, so, <laughs> so I won't. Any other questions? Okay, good luck to all of you. <laughs>